and I'm very happy to be with you as we celebrate this Blue Mass. My first pastor always used to tell me, no good deed goes unpunished. And certainly in our gospel, that is the case. Jesus has been engaged in a kind of a debate with the scribes and Pharisees. Yesterday they accused him and his disciples of doing work on the Sabbath, or day before Saturday morning in the readings, doing work on the Sabbath because they were hungry and they were going through the fields of grain, rubbing the grain in their hands and eating. That constituted work on a Sabbath day. But Jesus showed that even David and his men, they went into the temple and they did that which was generally speaking unlawful and they ate the holy bread because they were hungry. And that he was Lord even of the Sabbath. Today, Jesus wants to do great good. There's a man with a withered hand, he's crippled. And of course, disability in those days was a far greater stigma than in our day. And it also usually meant that one could not work. One could not be regularly with one's family. One was reduced to poverty. And Jesus saw an opportunity to do his Father's work, the work of bringing healing and mercy, of restoring life and health. And so he acted with compassion. He did good on the Sabbath. But for this, the scribes and Pharisees took Jesus to task. You did work on the Sabbath. They themselves, of course, were doing evil work on the Sabbath. They were plotting to trap Jesus. They had their own interpretation, a very narrow interpretation of the law. And they couldn't understand why the law existed. It existed to teach the people, little by little, how to love more. Jesus poses a ridiculous question to them about whether or not it's permitted to do good on the Sabbath. And of course, he gets no answer because they know very well why God has made the Sabbath, for us to rest, to, for us to be restored. And that is precisely what Jesus is doing for the man with the withered hand. But it's from that moment then that they plot in earnest to kill him. It's interesting the call of the fishermen was only in chapter 5 of St. Luke's Gospel, and here we are only at the start of chapter 6, and they're already plotting to kill him. No good deed goes unpunished. Jesus went about preaching good tidings, glad tidings to the poor, healing the sick, casting out demons, forgiving, and forgiving even his enemies. And for this, they want to put him to death. Sometimes our actions are not understood. We want to do good every day. We want to protect and serve. We want to lay down our lives for our friends in humble service. And lots and lots of people are grateful. And I'm grateful for the service of our first responders. Right? But all the priests here could tell you, lots of people, lots of times we're always trying to serve, and we give lots of homilies, lots of sermons, and everybody will say, Nice homily, Father. Nice homily, Father. Nice homily, Father. And then there'll be that person. Father, can I have a word with you for a minute? And what you remember is the complaint. You remember the severity. And sometimes you lose perspective of the gratitude and of the great good that is done. To each and every one of you who serve the people of Columbus and beyond, let me on behalf of a grateful diocese say thank you. Let me also invite you to have perspective. Even if your actions are misunderstood, even if they are not always appreciated, you're still doing the right thing. You're still trying to provide people with security. We heard Psalm 62 as our responsorial psalm uh, about resting in God. Our souls find rest in God. But another translation of that is, my strength and my security is in the Lord. That's where we find rest, knowing that he is our strength. St. Paul speaks of this in our first reading from the letter to the Colossians. He has to suffer a lot too. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. In my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, which is the church. Every person here suffers in some way. Some of us suffer from physical illness. Some of us suffer from the misery of sin. Some people suffer from being misunderstood. 
Physical sufferings are also a type of suffering when you have to work long shifts or be away from your family. For your family members, it's also a suffering, if you will, to not have you close to them. Or that anxiety that comes wondering, will my spouse return home today? There is a kind of a tension there, and it's one with which we live, these types of sufferings. But St. Paul, despite the sufferings that he would have to endure, the beatings, the shipwreck, the scourging, all those sorts of things, being treated as the scum of the earth, the last at the end of the line, he carried out his mission. Why? St. Paul writes, It has been manifested to his holy ones to whom God chose to make known the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. It is Christ in you, the hope for glory. Elsewhere, St. Paul will say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I speak no longer of myself, but of Jesus Christ and him crucified. But think about that. It is Christ in you, the hope for glory. When you carry out your task of protecting and serving, when you go into work, do you recognize Christ at work in you, in your words, in the way you treat the citizens whom you serve? Is there understanding and compassion? And is it the understanding and compassion of Christ? In our dutifulness, in our fidelity, in our work ethic, is it Christ in you? Because if Christ is at work in you, then other people around you begin to see the hope of glory, the hope of something better than what this world has offered up until now. St. Paul says of Christ, it is he whom we proclaim, admonishing everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Is it in fact Christ whom I proclaim with my words and deeds? When I go back to my family, is it Christ whom I bring to them? Even Christ who is tired and had to go away to a quiet place to rest. Or Christ who said, Father, forgive them, they do not know what they are doing. Christ who sometimes looked at his disciples, what are you thinking of, but who never gave up on them. Christ who could give a glance to Simon Peter after his threefold denial and still love him. He said, this is the Christ whom we proclaim and no other. This is the gospel we proclaim and no other. There is no greater love than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus said to his disciples, you are my friends if you do what I command you, love one another. Jesus gave his disciples an example by humbly washing their feet and by ultimately laying down his life for them on the cross. For this I labor and struggle in accord with the exercise of his power working within me. There is power and there is authority, but both are given to us for service. St. Paul understood this acutely. The same should, we should think about when we go to work or when we go home to our children or our spouse. How do I use this power, this authority? And really, what is the true power? Because some people would think that military weapons and guns are the true power. Some people would think that might always makes right. But we are Christians. We do not believe that for one minute. Some people think we can use the power of terror and terrorism to achieve our ends. And certainly, on this date in 2001, our world changed forever. A new threat of terrorism, a war in Iraq, a war in Afghanistan, continuing war in Syria, war in Ukraine. But where does it get us? And we could think of it on the global stage, but we could think about it in our streets. Gun violence, drug violence, domestic violence at home. 
What is the solution? What is the answer? What is the power? It is the power of love. This is the world's true power, the power that actually changes hearts. But that power has a name. And he was not born in wealth, but in poverty. He came not to terrorize us, but to win us over with his love and gentleness. This is the Christ whom we proclaim, so that hearts may be encouraged, brought together in love, to have all the richness of assured understanding for the knowledge of the mystery of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Indeed, when we refer to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, an invocation in that litany is Sacred Heart of Jesus, Heart of Jesus, in which are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It is a heart that knows how to love. Jesus' heart was moved com with compassion for the man with the withered hand, and so he healed him and made him whole. Jesus has compassion upon us and can heal us and make us whole. But then restored by the power of his compassion, by the power of his love, we must ask, what is my responsibility? It is to proclaim Christ, our hope, the world's hope for glory, the world's only hope for peace. Let us pray with earnest that Christ may be with us and that he may give us the gift of peace.